Project CJ64 is a journey I began several months ago with the goal of creating an enclosure inspired by my first computer, the Commodore 64, which will hold the old mainboard from my framework when the time comes to upgrade the laptop. The project started here with the CJ64 version 1, a complete PC in a mechanical keyboard, involved to version 1.2. There were many revisions before, in between, and after, ultimately leading to this. This box is fresh from a manufacturing plant in China and contains the final machined aluminum version of the CJ64 framework case which is here just in time as Framework has released the next generation of Framework laptop with the availability of mainboard upgrades for current users coming soon. So today I'm gonna quickly take you through the design process and reasoning that took place from here to here. I have some final machining things to do, then I'll assemble the PC and finally test it out. That's the plan, let's execute. It's the money. Okay guys, I fibbed a little. This box is actually empty as I already unboxed the enclosure a couple of weeks ago over on my Patreon channel as a thank you to my small but loyal group of patrons for their direct support for this project. More on that later, but here is the final CJ64 case, which consists of three machined aluminum parts and three 3D printed components. Let's start with the main components. All three of these I had manufactured with an online CNC service called Fictiv. The quote I got from them, which included media blasting and anodizing, was significantly lower than all the other quotes that were for machining only, so no finishing. I was skeptical as a result, but that skepticism was immediately negated as soon as I unpacked these because these parts are gorgeous. The machining is flawless and meets all the tight tolerances required for the case. The media blasting finish is completely consistent and perfectly smoothed and softened the entire surface, removing any sharp edges, and there are zero tool marks anywhere on the parts. And the clear anodizing gives it the perfect finish color. This all did come with a price tag of $800 US. Prototype manufacturing is not cheap, so Almost all the changes I made from version 1.2 to this were changes to reduce the manufacturing cost as much as possible. So the first thing I did was redesign the parts so they could all be manufactured from a single side and didn't require the part to be flipped. For example, the keyboard case had a lip routed into the bottom, which allowed it to fit snugly into the mainboard case and the edges above the expansion ports were chamfered. I completely flattened the bottom so the keyboard case could be entirely machined from a single plane. The main board case as designed required machining from three different planes, which was entirely cost ineffective. So completely cutting out the expansion ports, ventilation ports, and the Wi-Fi antenna mounting location allowed the part to be machined just from the top and that's where the 3D printed parts come in. First, I have the expansion port enclosures, which will fit right in here. And the Wi-Fi antenna cover, which goes right in here and allows me to attach internal Wi-Fi antenna to the back side of it, so the antenna won't be totally encased in metal. Or if when I test it, it doesn't work great, I can just drill out a couple of holes and attach a couple of external Wi-Fi antenna. Ultimately, this will be connected in a way that won't need Wi-Fi, but I want to keep the option available if possible. The final part is the cover plate that goes on here on the keyboard case and covers up the keyboard connection wires. And this is the only part I was a little disappointed in as the text and logo were supposed to be engraved. However, it it's just screen printed on. That's on the manufacturer. On me is the fact that I forgot to include the required tolerance for the anodizing, which does add material to the part. So I fixed that in my design and to fit the part, I very lightly filed and sanded the edges of the plate so they can easily fit now. 
Now, the second problem is that I'm afraid the tiny M2 screws I had planned to use to screw the plate in are just too fragile and I run the risk of shearing a screw during assembly or disassembly. So I've decided to go with a magnetic attachment solution, which leads me into the finishing manufacturing stuff I still need to do. For the plate and the case, I'm simply gonna drill out pockets on each one and epoxy in these tiny neodymium magnets and to fill the screw holes, I'm gonna use these tiny M.2 by four screws, which will simply be decorative at this point, but in my design, I removed the screw holes and added the magnet pockets. Now, two other ways I cut cost was to remove deep pockets, and I didn't have any of the screw holes tapped, meaning I didn't have them threaded. The main board case is gonna be screwed to the keyboard case from the bottom, so I need to drill the mounting holes all the way through the case to the bottom and then countersink the holes on the bottom of the case. And I need to drill and tap the mounting holes on the bottom of the keyboard case, and then I'll tap the rest of the screw holes. So that's a lot of tedious drilling and tapping work I need to do, but y'all can watch the glamorous version of it. Let's do this. Okay, it's done. And I really wish I could say that it was a cakewalk and everything went perfectly, but not only did that take over eight hours to do all the drilling, tapping, and assembling, but the worst thing that could have possibly have happened, happened. Why do deep pockets cost extra? Because in drilling a deep two millimeter hole through 6061 aluminum, there's a very strong possibility that a bit's gonna break, and I broke a bit. Oh, and it broke in the worst possible place, in one of the corner mounting points on the bottom of the keyboard case. So unfortunately for now, I have a gap in that corner of the case, which after the time, money, and effort that went into this, is super frustrating, but once I take this thing back apart and return the main board to its laptop chassis, I think I should be able to drill and tap a hole from the top under the panel to screw that corner down. Other than that, everything else worked out brilliantly. The magnets to secure the access plate worked great. In fact, I can probably reduce the number of magnets down from 10 to just six. Also, now that it's assembled, 
I'm definitely convinced that getting rid of the screws will be better, giving a much cleaner look. So I will be having another panel made because the rest of the computer is super clean. The geometry is sharp, but all the edges are smooth. I do miss not having the bevel on the bottom of the keyboard case above the expansion ports, but considering how much more it costs, I can live with it. The TTY slash dev keycap colorway complements the clear anodized aluminum case perfectly. Now for a keyboard, it is high with a front key height of almost five centimeters. Even with low profile switches and keycaps, it would still be high as the case itself has a front height of 35 millimeters, but with the wrist rest, it's perfectly comfortable. In the assembly montage there, you saw I added some small silicon feet, but I actually like a pretty steep angle on my keyboard, so I stuck the 3D printed feet from version 1.2 on here, which gives the deck about a five degree pitch. Now it's perfect. The combination of the spring swapped drop halo switches and the MT3 profile caps, this is definitely the best keyboard I own. Well, and it's definitely the most expensive. I typed out this entire closing script on it and it feels great. It also sounds great. I was worried that with a hollow mainboard case under the keyboard case, it would add resonance to the sound, but I added foam between the PCB and plate and under the PCB to dampen the sound because I prefer a more subdued or quiet keyboard and it worked. Check it out. The left shift needs some stabilizer tuning and the space bar probably needs a heavier switch spring, but overall I'm very happy. Now, what about the computer part of it? After all, it's a complete PC in a mechanical keyboard. Well, first I had a one cable solution using this USB-C hub, but despite it being able to deliver 100 watts of power, I couldn't get the system to post when using it. However, connecting the framework mainboard directly to the 100 watt power supply, it worked. Not sure why that is, but there are still bugs when using the mainboard outside of the laptop case or disconnected from the battery. One of those being that once you boot the PC the first time and then shut it down, you need to disconnect and reconnect it to the power to restart it, or sometimes you can press and hold the surface mounted power button for several seconds to reset it. But I found that just setting the BIOS to boot on power connect seems to work every time. In fact, this version of the CJ64 doesn't even have a power switch, but more on that in a bit. Next, my internal Wi-Fi solution worked with no noticeable signal loss. Speeds are exactly where they should be on my network. As far as thermals and performance, well, you may have noticed I added a thermal pad to the bottom of the case directly under the back of the CPU socket, and it's working as the aluminum case is absorbing a good amount of the heat in conjunction with the huge intake vents I put on this thing. And with all that, well, <laughs> It performs exactly the same as it does in a laptop chassis. The 1165 G7 is what it is. It's a really fast, really hot chip. There was no difference in any performance metrics or benchmarks, but I did notice then when hitting the CPU as hard as possible with the ADA 64 stress test, it was able to maintain near max all core boost speeds for considerably longer than I've ever seen. And idle temps are considerably lower than normal. So. While the case does provide better cooling for the CPU, it doesn't really result in any performance gain. So as we come to the end of Project 64, what's next and how exactly can you get your own CJ64 enclosure to repurpose your framework mainboard? Well, I think I've done the keyboard PC justice with this modern interpretation of the Commodore 64. From this, dozens of ideas have spun their way through my brain, including the carved maple and brass version I had mentioned in the past, but I think I'm gonna leave all those ideas out there with y'all and hopefully inspire other creators to pick up and build on this. That doesn't mean I'm done creating alternative enclosures for the framework mainboard. I'm just exploring different ideas, and I think the next move from my brain to a physical product is an enclosure that incorporates the main board, a Thunderbolt to PCIe adapter, and a mini ITX graphic card like my RTX 3050. I'm thinking of something like a smaller version of my Razer GPU enclosure, so be sure to get subscribed for that and to see the final, final CJ64 when I replace the plate and fix the gap. 
There won't be a video, but I'll definitely post community updates. And I do need some help. You notice I removed the physical power button, the plunger that pressed the main board button. See, I designed all of this before Framework released any schematics or technical drawings, hence all the trial and error. But now that I have the main board pinouts, I can wire in an actual power button. But where should it go? Here on the top plate, like the original switch, or on the back plastic panel? Let me know in the comments, well, before I have another panel cut. Anyway, that leads me to how you can get your own CJ64. Well, I debated doing something like a crowdfunding project, maybe a Kickstarter to have a limited number of them produced. The more units I have fab, the cheaper the per unit cost gets. I could do a run of 20 for a customer cost of about $400 each, but that involves me having to do all the extra fabrication work on every unit. And honestly, I don't really have that kind of time. So I don't think that can happen, but if there is enough interest from people who are skilled and equipped enough to do the additional fabrication themselves, then I may consider doing a one-time run. Let me know in the comments, but only if you're positive. For everyone else, there's a link in the description to a GitHub repository with all the STL files needed to 3D print your own. If you don't have a 3D printer, there's also a link to Cloudcraft, an online service that will print it for you. I had a copy of the framework case printed with them and the quality on it was good for the price. If you want the full 3D step files so you can machine your own case, those are on my Patreon page and for now, exclusive to my patrons because they did considerably subsidize the cost of this. My Patreon page link is also below and as much as I'd love you all to join me there permanently for just $3 a month, you are free to cancel at any time. Now, because I was accepted into the framework main board development program, although I haven't actually received the board yet, all future projects will be completely open source on my GitHub. So that's a wrap on Project CJ64, guys. Let me know what you think. And if you missed the start of the project, be sure to check out those videos. And of course, like, share, and subscribe. I hope to catch you in the next one.